Hi everyone, uh, this is a lecture on knowledge representation systems. So categorization in knowledge is the study of how we organize the sensory world into meaningful and usable mental structures. So up until now, uh, we've been discussing sensation and perception and low-level vision and the extraction of features from the perceptual world. Uh, what I want to talk about now um, in this lecture and for the next few weeks is how we organize that information uh, into different kinds of representations in our memory. Uh, these structured representations allow us to carry out uh, other things like our behaviors and problem solving, um, making inductive inferences and plans and understanding the world. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the fundamental cognitive mechanisms that are recruited uh, to bring structure to this sensory world. One of the first things we want to talk about is how our ideas and memories and thoughts uh, represented and organized in the mind. So this is the, this is the study of knowledge representation. Uh, and we're going to talk about a few of them over the next few uh, lectures. Uh, we're going to talk about embodied cognition, uh, and that's the idea that uh, representations and knowledge uh, go beyond just what's in the mind. Uh, they include information about uh, how to grasp objects and how things feel and smell. So uh, taking into account some of the perceptual and sensory and motor aspects of uh, things in the world. Uh, then we'll talk about some logical amodal systems like hierarchical models and spreading activation. Uh, we'll also talk about schema theory, which is, the, uh, which is a way to represent information for events uh, and uh, information that uh, helps you uh, know how to behave uh, in different situations. That's this lecture. Uh, and then I'm in lecture 5.3, which will be in person, uh, we'll be talking about concepts and categories. So let's get on with this discussion. So knowledge representation systems, I want to talk about two of them in greater detail. Uh, the other we'll just talk about briefly. Uh, and the first of these are the perceptual symbol systems or the embodied cognition ideas. And this is where all representation, this theory suggests that all representation is represented in terms uh, that are modality specific and perceptual. So when you think about or represent knowledge about objects, like for example, uh, your coffee cup, uh, you're going to represent things about uh, what it looks like, what it's called, but also how it feels in your hand and uh, the grasp that you need in order to be able to pick it up. So perceptual systems include information about sensation and perception uh, and are, they tie the representation to those perceptual systems. Amodal symbol systems, on the other hand, uh, assume that uh, some of our knowledge uh, and some of our ideas and some representations and memories are inherently non-perceptual. Uh, that we can store information uh, in ways that doesn't necessarily include perceptual information. Uh, and also it emphasizes uh, the way in which these ideas are related to each other in terms of ideas, features, uh, and names rather than uh, perceptual aspects. And then finally, dual code theory, uh, which uh, Anderson talks a little bit about in the textbook as well, uh, is a theory that suggests th that for some concepts, in fact many concepts, uh, many ideas, uh, we have multiple representations. We have a visual or uh, spatial or perceptual representation, but we also combine that with an amodal uh, verbal uh, label for some things. And other ideas might be primarily uh, amodal. Uh, so in this dual code theory, it suggests that we have more than one representational system for an idea. So let's talk briefly about the perceptual systems first. Uh, and a lot of this work comes from Larry Barcelo's research. Uh, and one great example has to do with comprehending sentences. Uh, so if I give you a sentence that requires some perceptual interpretation, like uh, look over there by the river. Uh, see, I even did this in my office, by the way. I pointed at the direction of Medway Creek, which uh, for me is uh, to my left, which... Uh, is out the window. So when I think of Medway Creek, I think of being down there. When I think of my home, I think of being over this way on the southwest end. Uh, so even when I'm talking about them, using a completely um, you know, innocuous sentence like, look over there by the river, my arm automatically sort of goes over <laughs> towards the river. Uh, that's the idea that Barcelo is trying to get across. And what he found is that when people read sentences, uh, they derive perceptual representations. Uh, when they read sentences about uh, walking somewhere or picking something up, you can detect additional brain activation in areas that correspond 
uh, to uh, those sensory motor areas. So if it's a sentence that has to do with uh, swinging something, there'll be additional activation uh, in the area of the brain that corresponds with uh, swinging an object. Uh, if it's a, a, a sentence that involves walking, there'll be additional uh, brain activation in the area of the brain that corresponds to uh, how your legs are controlled. So there's these motor aspects of uh, representation, even when just listening to a simple sentence. And this, can, this, is, this is known as embodied cognition, and it emphasizes the contribution of motor action and how it connects to the environment. Uh, another example, uh, and again, this has to do with uh, brain activation when uh, individual uh, words or terms or concepts are mentioned, uh, and this was a study from uh, the early 2000s, uh, looking at fMRI activation when people listen to verbs, uh, just single words, that involve the face, the arm, or the leg. And what they predicted was that if a verb is something that is face-related uh, or arm-related or leg-related, uh, that you'll see some residual activation, some additional activation in those areas of the brain that correspond specifically to the face, to the arm, or to the leg. And in fact, that's what they found. This figure shows uh, what they found. So on the left, uh, you can see the brain areas uh, that are active when people move their foot, their finger, or their tongue. Uh, and you can see the blue areas correspond to the foot movement, uh, the red areas correspond to fingers, uh, and the green correspond to tongue movements. On the right-hand side, uh, panel B, you can see the areas that are activated when uh, subjects just listen to a verb uh, that corresponds to something you do with your leg, your arm, or your face. And you can see the overlap uh, between the movement areas. So when participants heard an arm word, uh, it differentially activated at greater activation in the same areas of the brain that correspond to uh, when they were asked to actually move their fingers or arms. Uh, so uh, this suggests that there is, uh, even just in a simple word, uh, you're activating areas of the brain without even being told to. Uh, these areas of the brain are activated uh, when they hear words about your legs or about your arms or about your face. And this is this idea of uh, embodied cognition that uh, when we're thinking and when we're reading and even just hearing sentences or simple words, uh, single words, uh, we're activating areas of the brain that correspond to any kind of sensory motor information that uh, is conveyed in those uh, words. So that's the perceptual side of knowledge representation, but a lot of our knowledge is stored and connected to other ideas in ways that isn't necessarily tied uh, to um, you know, uh, to movement. Uh, so, you know, if you're hearing about a cat, for example, uh, maybe you don't have a particular movement associated with a cat. Now, maybe you do have a cat and you like to scratch their forehead or something like that, or maybe pet them along the side. Maybe you do have some additional activation there. But there's a lot about cats that isn't necessarily stored in your sensory motor uh, representations. So, they're rep, you know. A cat's connection to other animals, uh, its relationship with dogs, its relationship with other cats. All of that stuff is uh, not connected to your perceptual system, but is connected to this idea of semantic knowledge and semantic memory. Uh, so we need to have some theories to explain how those ideas are connected to each other, irrespective of perception. That doesn't mean that perception isn't involved, uh, but let's talk about how uh, knowledge is represented irrespective of its perceptual aspects. One of the earliest attempts uh, to explain how humans represent knowledge uh, goes back to the, uh, some early work done by uh, Collins and Quillian. So Collins and Quillian uh, suggested that we store a lot of our knowledge about the world in a hierarchical system. One of the reasons they were interested in a hierarchy is that a hierarchy saves memory space. Uh, if you represent a piece of information uh, let's, we're going to call this a node on a hierarchy, which you'll see in the next few slides. Uh, this knowledge is or organized in a hierarchy within a spreading activation system. So two ideas there. Uh, the hierarchical structure suggests that any piece of information here at a level on the hierarchy influences things that are below it in that hierarchy. So properties that are true of one concept uh, will be true of things that are subordinate to that concept. Uh, the other idea here is spreading activation. So once you activate a concept by thinking about it or reading about it or seeing it, activation spreads to other areas 
of this network, uh, other areas of this hierarchy, in a predictable way. Let's see how this works in, a, uh, in an experimental paradigm, and then let's talk about how a hierarchy might be structured uh, that respects some of these uh, principles. So one of the earliest studies they did was a sentence verification study. Uh, and really, they're just asking their participants to say yes or no to propositions. Uh, and you can see there are two kinds of propositions there on this uh, figure. So they're asked things about uh, object properties. So what can an object do? Or what kind of properties does it have? Uh, and then they're also asked things about the category that the object belongs in. So you might be asked, can a canary sing? Uh, and you'd say yes. A canary can fly, and you could say yes. A uh, canary has skin, and you might say yes. Uh, a canary has uh, gills, you would say no. Right? So you say yes or no to simple questions. Um, you can also answer questions about the uh, category that the object is in. A canary is a canary, so it's in its own category of canaries. You say yes. A canary is a bird, uh, you say yes. A canary is an animal, you also would say yes. A canary is a fish, you would say no. Uh, so these are sentence verifications. Simple statement, it's a yes or no answer, but we're not really interested in whether or not you say yes or no, because we kind of assume that uh, as the subject you know that canaries can fly. What we're interested in is how quickly you can say yes. Uh, and what is shown here on the graph, uh, on the y-axis, is the response time in milliseconds. Uh, so a thousand milliseconds is one second. Uh, when you're asked, a canary can sing, it takes you a little bit more than a second to answer yes as quickly as possible. Uh, when you're asked, a canary can fly, it takes you a little bit longer to say yes. And when you're asked, a canary has skin, it takes you a little bit longer still. And what they found was that uh, for some properties that were closely associated with the object, like singing, uh, canaries can sing, uh, people were really quick. Uh, but when they were further away, like canaries can fly, which is true of canaries, but it's true of other animals too, like other birds and even bats, uh, it takes a little bit longer. And when you're asked, it has skin, well, yeah, canaries have skin. It's obvious, right? Because they're birds, which are animals. But you don't normally think of that as a property of a canary, do you? Right? I mean, it's probably not the first thing that comes to mind. And what they're suggesting is that there's a reason for that, and that's because you don't store that information with your representation or your knowledge of canaries. In fact, you store having skin uh, with your knowledge about animals. And they suggested that these kinds of effects, these uh, increasing reaction times to say yes or no to uh, more distant uh, properties, uh, can be captured in a hierarchical system. And this is what the hierarchy looks like. Uh, and this respects some of the principles we laid out on the earlier slide about what a hierarchy should be, uh, that there are nodes and there are connections. right? So here we can see our canary there on level three. Canaries sing and they're yellow. There's probably other things you know about canaries, but let's just hold it at that. right? So canaries have three things, actually, on this uh, network, uh, hierarchical network. They can sing, they're yellow, and they're also birds. right? So all three of those are properties of canary. Uh, two of them are things that the canary has, and one of them is something that the canary is. Now, if we're asked a question about something uh, that is not stored directly next to canary, so uh, if a canary has feathers, uh, we don't have that piece of information stored with canary. We have it stored up with birds. So we travel, the activation spreads, we travel through the network, we go to bird, and then we find the property can fly uh, or has feathers. When we're asked, does a canary have skin or can a canary breathe, uh, we find that it's not stored with canary. We go up to the next level, bird. It's not stored with bird, but bird is also an animal. That's one of its connections. So we go up to animal, and then we look for that property, and we find it. And what they reasoned is that this kind of uh, structure, this kind of knowledge representation, explains their results pretty well. Uh, when you have to travel further in this hierarchical structure, uh, it takes you just a little bit longer, and that accounts for the delay in the reaction time to answer questions like a canary has skin versus a canary uh, can sing. So other properties of this hierarchical structure is that everything that's true of animal, uh, so has skin, can move around, is true of everything that it's a subordinate, birds, fish, ostriches, and salmon. 
Uh, all of these things have that property, uh, and they can inherit those properties. Uh, and so this accounts for a lot of the data that we have uh, on uh, how we represent objects and how we represent concepts. But not everything. One of the things you might notice uh, is that some properties are more closely associated with some of the subordinate uh, members. So, for example, salmon, uh, we're storing it's pink, it's edible, it swims upstream to lay eggs. Those are things that are true of uh, salmon. But maybe you also think about uh, salmon skin. Uh, if you eat salmon cooked on the grill, the skin's going to get kind of crispy, right? Uh, now that's stored way up with animal, but I don't know, for me, I would think that salmon skin is something that's a closely associated property. Uh, and there's other sort of anomalies like that. Um, chicken, uh, you know, a chicken is a bird that has properties of birds, but most of us don't think of it that way, right? We might think of it as a farm animal or a livestock or something like that. So it doesn't capture all of our information. Uh, and this hierarchy might be a little too strict to cover everything. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work for some knowledge representation. Uh, it just means that it might not work for uh, describing all of how we represent objects and concepts and so on. Now, other researchers have suggested that the hierarchical structure may not be necessary, uh, that a lot of these reaction time differences and response differences can be accounted for by general spreading activation networks. Uh, and so we see this idea of a spreading activation semantic network uh, present in a lot of different theories. Uh, so we'll talk about one model here from 1975, but this idea of a semantic network uh, and a representational network is still, uh, I think, a really current theory, and you see it in uh, large neural networks of ideas, right? So, I mean, you probably notice these kinds of things when you're shopping online, right? You shop for something on Amazon, uh, it's going to recommend similar products, uh, and it's going to recommend products that are similar to those products. Uh, and so the idea is it's trying to match uh, what you think you're going to want uh, by predicting the next thing, uh, the next close associate uh, to something you just purchased. So this idea of spreading activation suggests that information, when you store information in your mind through memories, uh, is represented in some kind of a network and that related concepts, which we'll refer to as nodes in this system, are linked by association. Associate, association. Things that are close to each other uh, are going to be closely associated. Uh, they're going to be related concepts. Uh, if you read one of them or hear one of them, you'll quickly think of the other. Uh, it doesn't take very long to get from one concept to the other. Uh, but you can think about distant concepts as well, and it's going to take you longer to verify those properties or to come up with uh, features for those distantly uh, related concepts. Activation spreads through this network. Uh, so for example, if you think of the color red, it's going to be closely associated with a network of other colors, orange and yellow and green. Uh, it might be also closely associated with some fruits like cherries, which are then closely associated with apples and pears. It might be also associated with roses, flowers, and violets. Uh, so red has all of these associates. Uh, colors, the fire engine, the fire, uh, cherries, uh, roses, sunsets. Uh, but each one of those concepts is related to a different network. Uh, and so you can see that although red and street are not directly related, uh, there might be some uh, connection, right? You can get to street uh, from red uh, if you go via uh, fire engine, vehicle, and so on. So this explains not only how we have uh, closely related and distantly related concepts, but also how we might be able to retrieve information from that. Uh, and it has to do with you're asked a question uh, that comes from two different parts of a network, uh, the information spreads from one part of a network, spreads from the other part of a network, and then it might sum at the node that you need to retrieve. Let's look at the next slide to see how that might work. So you've got a lot of information about water, right? You've got concepts uh, related to what it is, what it can do, uh, properties, it's in lakes, boats float on it, it freezes into ice, freezes into snow, it's in rivers. Uh, lots of things you know about water, including the chemical formula. Uh, so if you're asked, what's the chemical formula for water? Water activates all of these things. The activation spreads whether you want it to or not. Uh, you've got information for chemical formulas that you might know. Information spreads to the formulas you, that you know, and H2O should be the one that's most heavily activated in this case, right? So you activate water, 
spreads out. Activate chemical formula spreads out, and it meets right at the chemical formula for water. And that's the fact uh, that you remember. So both the hierarchical model and the spreading activation model are kind of general purpose models uh, that can encode information and relationships about uh, objects and things and ideas and events, uh, all sorts of semantic information. A schema, on the other hand, is a general knowledge structure uh, that encodes information about types of situations. Uh, usually this is personally relevant, uh, so th situations that you find yourself in. Uh, and these are structured in a particular way to help you understand the situation and behave appropriately. Um, early on in this class, uh, maybe it was the first or the second lecture, I think I talked a little bit about, or maybe I used the example of, uh, you know, most of us haven't been in a lecture setting for a while, right? And some of you, uh, as second year students, may not have had uh, a university lecture at all yet. Uh, maybe mine on Wednesday, the first day of class, was your first university class uh, because last year was online. Uh, and I suggested that even though maybe it was your first big university lecture, you didn't have any difficulty figuring out what to do, right? I mean, uh, you kind of have a general sense of how to act in a lecture, right? You've been in uh, high school settings, you've been in a large uh, uh, maybe you've been in a large lecture of some sort or a, a presentation or some kind of assembly. So all of that information comes together uh, and it lets you know how to behave. So you've got a schema for how to act in lecture. You come into the room, uh, you find a seat that's comfortable to you, uh, not too close to somebody, maybe not too far in the back, not too far in the front. Uh, you get your laptop out uh, and you wait for somebody to uh, begin the lecture. Those are all different things uh, that you've acquired through your experience, uh, and you've encoded them in some particular structure uh, that lets you know what comes next. And if something is missing, uh, like for example, if there were no, uh, you know, if there was no flip desk uh, in the chair, uh, you'd figure something out. You'd say, well, there's no flip chair, so I can use my, uh, you know, put my laptop on my knees or something like that. So we have a schema that lets us know that we have certain things that we expect. Uh, there's expectations that we can generate with this general knowledge structure. Let's look at how this might look in a more uh, sort of abstract way. So uh, suppose you like to eat ice cream. Who doesn't, right? I mean, ice cream is pretty popular. Lots of places in London to, get, to eat good ice cream. There's the uh, Haven's Creamery uh, in sort of the Richmond Row area, which is delicious. Uh, there's some of the frozen yogurt places. There's the place, I don't know if it's still there, that makes the rolled up ice cream. So all these great ice cream places, right? Um, and you probably have a schema for the different ways in which you might purchase ice cream. You can purchase it at the store, uh, purchase it at a convenience store, uh, buy it in uh, containers from the, right from the uh, creamery, so whether it's you go to Shaw's or London Ice Cream or something like that. Um, so there's a person. That's a, like a variable. A person has to buy it. Uh, there's an item, uh, whether you're buying a cone or a sundae or a pint. Uh, there's a flavor right? There's someone who's selling it and there's a cost. Each one of these can be filled in. So the idea of a schema is that it's a structure that has variables and you fill those in based on your experience. You know that anytime you're going to buy ice cream, you need a buyer, a seller, an item, a flavor, and a cost. Those are the things that count. Now, some of these things correlate, right? So if it's, a, uh, if it's an ice cream cone, then it's likely being purchased from uh, either an ice cream cart or some kind of uh, ice, ice cream shop like Haven's Creamery. If it's an ice cream container, it might be purchased from a grocery store or shopper's drug or something like that. Uh, so we fill these variable slots in uh, in order to help us to predict what's coming next. So in the uh, cone buying scenario, you kind of assume that it's going to be relatively low cost, right? Uh, and that there'll be a particular vendor, so maybe this is an ice cream cart or something like that. Uh, so these schemas help us know what to predict. Uh, so once you've decided to buy a vanilla cone uh, at a soft serve, uh, you kind of know what framework uh, the cost is going to be. It's going to be somewhere in you know, the range of 3 or $4. Uh, it's going to be different if you go to the grocery store and buy a pint of ice cream. That's a different variables filling into the same schema. The idea is this schema is the framework. We fill the variables in with our experience, uh, and it lets us know what's coming next. It gives us some predictive power. Uh, schemas are activated by keywords and key concepts, uh, sometimes by the location. Uh, the activation of schemas infects encoding 
and retrieval of information. Uh, and so oftentimes we find ourselves in different situations. Uh, we activate uh, the schema and we can adjust things accordingly. Uh, think about going out to eat, for example. Um, you might have a general schema for how you can behave in a restaurant. Uh, if you're in um, you know, a fast food restaurant or a restaurant where you go up to a counter to order, uh, you expect different things to happen, right? Maybe you expect to stand there until they hand you the food, or maybe you go and get seated until they call your name out. Uh, if you go to a higher-end restaurant, you expect a host to seat you and someone else to come over and take your order. Uh, so you kind of behave differently because the schema gives you different information, activates different variables, and you can fill those in based on your experience. Uh, so as I said, schemas affect your ability to encode information, but also your ability to retrieve information. And sometimes we're given some information in one schema, uh, and then we realize it's a different schema that we need to use to encode the information. And that allows us to access other pieces of information that maybe we didn't have the variable slots for. Let me give you an example. So uh, schemas affect how information is encoded and retrieved. And there's a great study by Pritchard and Anderson where uh, the subjects read uh, sort of a text passage about two boys walking through a house. Uh, and they were given a context or a schema before reading the passage. Uh, and so that allowed them to look for certain things that would fill in uh, their schema. So if you've got slots in your schema, you fill it in uh, based on the schema you were given. Uh, later, they're going to ask their subjects to remember some other information. Turns out they can't remember some of the other details, but uh, later they're given a different schema. So they don't ask to reread the, sent the paragraph. They're just given a different schema, and they can remember new things. Now they have different variable slots. Let me show you how this works. So pretend you're a burglar or a potential home buyer. So two kinds of people who might be interested in what a house looks like, right? So someone who's going to break in and rob uh, versus someone who might want to buy the house. And the story goes like this. Two boys ran until they came to the driveway. See, I told you today was a good day for skipping school, said Mark. Mom is never home on Tuesday, he added. Tall hedges hid the house from the road, so the pair strolled across the finely landscaped yard. I never knew your place was so big, said Pete. Yeah, it's nicer now than it used to be since Dad had the new stone siding put on and added the fireplace. Stop right there. So there's some information there that's probably relevant to burglars, right? Which one would you think? So mom is never home on Thursday. Uh, so if you knew that mom was never home on Thursday, uh, and let's suppose, um, you know, Pete uh, is the one who is sort of the guest here. That seems like it's Mark's house. Let's suppose Pete is thinking about breaking into this house, right? Thursday's the day to do it. Um, tall hedges hide the house if you're a burglar. Uh, the place is big. That's useful to know if you're a burglar. It's probably going to have a lot of stuff in it, right? Uh, stone siding. This is irrelevant for a burglar. They're not going to steal a stone siding, but that might be an important piece of information if you are a potential buyer. And so as you go through this paragraph, you'll see that there are things... Uh, like uh, an like bikes in the garage uh, and things uh, like the side door that's always open. Uh, that's important for burglars. Um, newly painted uh, in the downstairs, not really important for burglars, maybe useful for real estate. Um, no houses could be seen. That's probably good for both. So you can see that there are things that are important for burglars, things that might be remembered more if you were thinking about this from the perspective of a house buyer. Um, then afterwards, they ask subjects to verify information and remember information that was in there, and they found that people remembered schema-consistent information. So if you were told to think about this from the perspective of a house buyer, you remembered things like the stone siding and the finely landscaped yard uh, and the brightly lit room and that sort of thing. Uh, if you were asked to think about this with the schema of burglar, then you remembered things like mom was never home on Thursday and the side door was always open. But it's not just an encoding effect. Um, it's more than just an encoding effect, and it suggests that memory is really flexible, that some of those facts didn't fit into a schema, but that doesn't mean that they weren't encoded. Uh, so, Again, the recall included more facts relevant to the context or the schema, but then people were told about the other context. So after you read it, and then you recalled the information that was consistent with home buyer, 
you were told, okay, now think about that paragraph you just read from the perspective of a burglar. And what they found is that subjects could then remember additional information that was consistent with the alternative schema. So the facts were there, the ideas were still there, uh, but they just hadn't placed it into their schematic memory. Right? They just didn't have a structure to understand it. Likely, if they had waited a little bit longer, some of that schema inconsistent information would probably fade, uh, and the schema consistent information would fade because it had a structure to help them put it into long-term memory. Uh, so memory is very flexible. Um, we can remember things whether we want, it, we want to or not. Uh, some things we remember more easily than others. And as we'll see in subsequent weeks, uh, a lot of times what you remember isn't exactly what you encoded. Right? You remember things differently uh, each time you remember them. Okay, so that's it for the knowledge structure lecture. Uh, we're going to be talking about a very specific kind of knowledge structure, a concept, uh, in the lecture on Wednesday.